our time. I'm Chris Irons, uh, Director of Independent Consultancy Firm Stratosolve, www.stratosolve.com.au. With me, or accompanying me, as always, Frank Higginson, Partner Hines, and industry or sector expert of considerable renown, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> you put some work into that. Hello, Chris. Hello, everyone. Hello, Jan. Um, posted up a comment already. It, um, Gosh, that, yeah. uh, you've got to be in it to win it, Jan. So thank you. We'll try and get to that one uh, as we go along. Um, as per always, uh, welcome, encourage comments, questions, queries. Um, if yours is a little bit more detailed, though, you're better off popping it into the link that's just gone up in the chat there. Uh, fill in your details and someone will get back to you. It's a, it's a better way of dealing with those more complicated questions. Kind of complicated issue today, Frank, but in some respects, not really. Um, so a bit, bit of both, I guess. Today, uh, pets, but in particular, pet approvals. And just to make sure we're clarifying it for everybody's benefit, what we're talking about today is the process where an owner or an occupier uh, goes to the committee to seek approval for a pet. This isn't pet disputes that go to the commissioner's office. This is within the body corporate. And so, Frank, it varies that process, doesn't it? It does. And I mean, I suppose this is a really best practice one from both sides of the fence, from both committee side of things and from an owner side of things. And I think, um, well, again, Chris, I suppose pet disputes have not gone away despite the law being relatively settled. So we're not going to get into a whole bunch of um, legal stuff today it's more about how to manage these things if you want to see though what we've done on pets previously just hop on our website and and search the term pet and you'll see probably i think probably three webinars and a whole bunch of written content so if you want to go into that level of detail go your hardest but today i suppose chris it's about trying to um take away some of the pain that causes pet disputes to start with and that's i suppose a properly made application and a properly made assessment of that application by the committee to whom it is being made and if though and if, yeah. if people follow our step-by-step -step guide today it'll probably make it a hell of a lot easier on both counts uh well summed up frank yeah and this is a a 50 50 uh webinar today we're going to try and spend an equal amount of time on the process for people applying for the pet approval and also for the committee what they need to do what they don't need to do actually uh as well um, so, and I think we're looking at this as the start of a how-to series. So we're looking at this kind of uh, thing being rolled out amongst other topics, how-to. Mm -hmm. This is a very much a practical how-to. It's certainly not legal advice, practical common sense advice based upon things we've seen. And we're talking here about situations where approval is actually required under a permissive pet bylaw. Uh, if there's no bylaw about pets, Happy days. Um, uh, if there is a prohibitive pet bylaw, though, very different story. Um, but the committee can't do anything other than refuse, uh, basically. But we're not going to get into that today. All right. Let's start off from the perspective, Frank, of the, we'll call them applicants. Uh, but here we really mean owners and occupiers. And remember, everybody, an occupier is effectively a tenant when it comes to Strata World. Step one, Frank, uh, the most critical. Well, what do your possibly. bylaws actually say? Hmm. That's the starting point. So um, there's because there's nothing. So the way that the legislation works is that bodies corporates can change their bylaws as they go. Bodies corporates get um, 11 sort of statutory bylaws when they come into existence if they haven't got anything else. And those statutory bylaws don't deal with pets at all. So to actually understand where you need to start from, you need a copy of the CMS and you need a copy of the bylaws. So, because and they're in Schedule C of that CMS. So probably the easiest way to get it, um, subject to what sort of um, platform you've got access to, a lot of the uh, Strata Manager platforms will have an owner's portal where you can hop online and get them. Um, the alternative is that you can go to Department of Natural Resources and we'll put a link up to that and you can get a copy of actual bylaws there. So you need to see what type of bylaw, well, whether there is a bylaw, as Chris mentioned before, um, and what it says. Yeah. Absolute starting point. And so that link has now gone up there. Uh, so ideally, if you're in the body corporate, you'll have your bylaws already. Uh, but if you don't, you can go to the titles office. There will be a cost to getting that. But you can be assured that they are the most up-to-date bylaws in that particular case. 
Step two, maybe as crucial, um, timing. Timing's everything in life generally, but timing in strata is, is everything, isn't it, Frank? Because the critical thing here is that everything which happens in the body corporate is a group decision, typically, and then every group decision has its own timeframes, doesn't it? Absolutely. So no individual committee member is going to make a decision to say yes. And the other thing, and this is what we spoke about last week, so we'll put a link up um, to this webinar as well, talking about owners dealing with committees is, um, I suppose you could watch the whole half hour of that, but I suppose in essence for me, the summary is committees are volunteers. They've usually got other things on their plate. Um, so serving them up with a request to approve a pet because you've got settlement tomorrow um, and you're making that request today isn't necessarily going to go down all that well. So um, you've really got to get ahead of the curve from a lot owner's perspective or an occupier's perspective. You've got to give people a, you know, the magic word reasonable um, and not that that necessarily applies in a legal sense, but you can't expect people to turn a decision around on five minutes notice, particularly if there's been issues with pets in the building before. Yeah. You've got to be a bit um, conscious of that and allow the committee to make an informed decision. So giving people the right time and allowing them the time to do that. Um, also, I suppose, Chris, without uh, lobbying a whole bunch of threats about, I'm going to lose the sale if you don't approve this by 5 p.m. today and you're giving it to them on that day, doesn't really help the process at all. It doesn't. And just to clarify what Frank's saying there, uh, committees have a legislated, uh, I'm loath to call the right, a legislated option to make a decision on your request as an owner uh, in six weeks. Uh, same with the tenant as well. Hmm. They can take another six weeks on top of that uh, if they have some reasonable grounds for doing so. So technically, the committee has up to 12 weeks to decide on your pet. Now, that doesn't mean they have to take 12 weeks. In fact, I think, Frank, we've been pretty clear that we don't think that they should be, um, but they could feasibly. Uh, if you do have compelling reasons, and sometimes it happens that circumstances beyond your control require a quicker decision, you need to be spelling that out. But the onus is upon you as the person applying to ensure that you've taken timeframes into account. So the best way around that is don't leave it up to somebody else. Don't assume that all will be okay if you've got a set time frame and pretty much every transaction in real estate has a set time frame. You need to make sure that that fits in with the approval process. Hmm. And step three, this sounds like a no-brainer, but uh, you'd be surprised. Who's actually applying for it? Who, yeah, is it is it the owner of the property or is it the prospective tenant of the property? Is it the owner on behalf of the tenant? It's sort of who, and, and I suppose part of that is who's the approval actually going to be granted to? It, it's um, making that clear. It, it does sound obvious, Chris, but if you simply send in a letter saying I'm seeking approval for a dog, hmm. on whose behalf? Your behalf? Someone else's behalf? Could even be a prospective buyer's behalf. Maybe, maybe you're going to auction and one of the uh, prospective buyers has a pet and wants yep. to know that the pet's going to be approved before they actually make a bid under auction conditions. Making that clear is a really important thing. And do you have authority to be making that request if you're doing it on somebody else's behalf as well? I mean, it's quite typical for real estate agents to also make requests. They, they have no standing when it comes to committee relationships. So if you're doing it on behalf of somebody, spell it out. I do this on behalf of and under what authority you're doing it to that would and be the same mate, every lawyer's letter starts with we act for we're not doing this ourselves we're writing on behalf of someone else we set that out first up absolutely that's a really good point frank uh next step step four uh make sure that you are actually aware of what is required from the particular body corporate manager and committee because frank my my experience of pretty much every body corporate management firm in queensland of a reasonable size they'll have their own forms about this sort of thing won't they yep absolutely some of them are even online in their portals um, some of them have one pages some are two pages some actually tell you the information they want um, some leave it up to you but either way most of the big companies will have a structured process and i suppose because you're not robinson crusoe in terms of seeking approval for a pet it happens a lot um, and mm. so again in terms of how to smooth the process it's working inside the parameters that other people have set body corporate managers do a lot uh, if you fit within what it is that they've given you it's going to make it easier for you to get that application yeah. to the committee 
that's what why else have they provided it yeah think, think along those terms it's probably a good moment to pick up on the question from mark mark thanks for your question uh mark says i'm maybe a real estate agent had an odd situation where a potential buyer sent a pet request before they'd even bought the property so they weren't an owner or occupier so is that valid should we ask the owner to submit on behalf you're quite right mark that's not spelt out that situation um i personally think it's perfectly okay for the committee to consider a pet approval from somebody who's neither the current owner or occupier so long as they spell it out what they're actually doing there what do you think frank yeah absolutely appropriate for the committee to consider it um if the committee wanted to be technical about it though they might be saying well who are you you know what I mean? So that's, so I think probably the answer to your last question, should we ask the owner to submit on their behalf? I'd say yes. It just it's takes easier. away yeah. one potential argument. But if the committee wants to do it that way, happy days. Yeah, it, it, yeah. but you're quite right, Mark. There's no specific provision about that scenario. Uh, and it can, I think that's exactly the point we were making on who was applying, which leads very nicely to step five. Um, you're clear about who's applying, be clear about what you're <laughs> applying for. Uh, one dog? Two dogs, dog and a cat, bird and a cat, lizard, dinosaur, crocodile. Crocodile, name. I remember that up in yeah, Cairns uh, that time. Um, names, ages, sexes, breeds. Um, you, you need to be very clear. I dealt with a client only just recently where that lack of clarity over what was being applied for was pretty central to the issue at play. It, I thought it was two things. It turned out to be one thing, but then in another place it seemed like two things and, and little wonder there was confusion and problems. Um, Frank, a lot of people prepare a resume, don't they? Absolutely. Pictures, pictures of cute, fluffy animals always works, but a resume and ideally some references. Yep. Like if you've lived in close quarters community living before, with the particular pet, then a reference from the body corporate manager or an adjoining owner or the resident manager or the landlord in relation to that pet being totally appropriate for the premises and no problems, all that sort of stuff would be sensational. Because one yeah. of the things that, um, you know, committees do get skittish about is what happens if it barks, it defecates on common property, it has fleas. So if you can address all of those things in terms of the resume and the references and the application itself, it's sort of tick, tick, tick. Now, ideally, maybe that's part of what the body corporate manager might ask you for if they've got that process, but if not, do it yourself. Put yourself in the shoes of where the committee is and say, if I was in their shoes and I didn't know Fido from a bar of soap, what would I be looking for to say yes? Yep, yep, absolutely, Frank. And we want to make sure that we split this 50 50 so we might step through the next couple a bit quickly and i think the next one very closely aligns to what you were just talking about frank provide supporting documents so that's vaccination certificate uh vet report if it's necessary the references frank really good point about that uh don't wait to supply supply because otherwise that might hold up the process um if you're saying that the animal is a support animal it's a good idea to have something to reference that as well. Don't just, uh, it's one thing to say it, it's another thing to actually have something which supports True. that. And as you said, Frank, a cute picture always helps. You might as well. Um, and step seven, I guess the final step, uh, and this is more a reminder than anything, but you made this point at the start, Frank, committees are volunteers. Don't bail them up in the lifts, don't bail them up by the pool, don't bail them up in the, in the car park about it. Uh, do it properly. It's not fair to do it. And it will put them offside, won't it? Yeah, absolutely. Who, who wants to be attacked with their own home? Mm. No one. So it's just not the way to get something done. Yeah. That's the reality of it. There's, there's a process. And I suppose, Chris, that leads us to, if you get the yes, great. If you get the yes subject to reasonable conditions, then great. And we won't, we'll, won't talk about conditions today. We'll park that. But what happens if you get a no? Ah, uh, indeed. So what happens if you get a no? I guess our first piece of advice to people, don't panic that's not necessarily the end of the story. So first step, don't panic. Um, if you have been given reasons when uh, you got the no, uh, Frank, it's a good idea to actually have a good think about the reasons and what you could possibly do to respond. Absolutely. So if the concern is um, the dog's gonna be barking all the time, is a bark collar appropriate? Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave it with a bark collar, you know. Or is it addressing the fact that um, when you've been at work previously, there was no bark, and here's a reference to actually deal with that. So it's a matter of looking at what the committee's raised and almost like whack a mole, knock it on the head, knock it on the head, knock it on the head, and keep going that way. So I, it, it's, yeah. um, but it's certainly not getting the email and then responding two minutes later with a massive broadside at everyone and threatening to sue them. That 24 hour rule, absolutely. <laughs> Sit on it, catch your breath. Um, might even be you go talk to a, a mate, body corporate manager, lawyer, dare I say it, strata consultant, about what's the way to deal with this. Because you certainly, sounds good in theory, making an application to the commissioner's office, but you're gonna wait 12 months to get an outcome because that's yeah. absolutely one they're gonna try to conciliate. Um, and that might or might not work for you timing wise. We would recommend that you don't just leap straight to that application at this point with, when you've got the no. Timing might be an issue, but we think asking for a reconsideration is always a good idea. Uh, and particularly if you can ask for a reconsideration based upon additional information. I don't think there's much point asking for a reconsideration if nothing's different the second time around. You actually have to be able to provide something which addresses the concerns raised. And then of course, Frank, if it's a no, and there's no reasons at all, just a flat, nah, that's a problem, isn't it? It is a problem, and I don't think that's reasonable. I think there's there's some conflicting adjudication decisions out there about that, but I think acting reasonably is it's for a committee to explain why it's made a decision. So it's um, so it's got to set it out. So an outright no, I don't think cuts it from a committee perspective, almost at any time, um, as much as some committees will want to do it that way. Um, there's got to be some transparency and there's got to be some accountability. And the reality is that, that decisions can be challenged. And I suppose more importantly, decisions can be changed. Yeah. So a committee is not like the Court of Appeal. There's the decision not subject to appeal all over. They can change their minds and they can change their minds based on whatever evidence gets served up to them. So, and that's that, that immediate reaction to a refusal. I think it's important to make sure that you don't poison the well of the relationship yeah. by reacting badly to start with. But if it is a flat, straight no, with no context and nothing else whatsoever, that might be the point to be seeking legal advice because that's yep. that's a problem, that one. Absolutely, yep. All right, let's flip the coin, Frank, uh, from the perspective of the committee now. So what are the tips that we would give committees in considering requests from owners or occupiers or their assistants or agents? It's, it's, it's almost, well, it's, it's, it starts in the same way. What do the bylaws say? Yep. Let's let's get the bylaws. You'd like to think the committee's going to be able to access those via the body corporate manager without having to do a search of their own on so. their own account. You would hope so. Um, the other one, I suppose, is the body corporate manager may well have a process that they're recommending that you follow. So, you know, body corporate managers do this for a living. So I don't see there's any reason to really go off the reservation if they've got a well-worn path that they recommend, which is an yeah. application asking for resumes and all the certificates and those sort of things. Um, but then. I suppose after that, um, this is where it gets a little bit nebulous, and that's that yeah. um, element of, of being reasonable, which is this great overriding statutory obligation that committees and bodies corporates have. They must act reasonably. So what um, that usually means is outright no's may well not cut it, explaining decisions is cut it, and having a blanket policy won't cut it. Because to me, and to both of us, I think, Chris, we can speak for you, um, acting reasonably isn't having a blanket policy that applies regardless of the circumstances. Yep, absolutely. Um, uh, it, you should also, acting reasonably also means that you avoid outrageous decisions. So I think animals are filthy and dirty, therefore we say no, that's not going to cut it. Um, Outrageous conditions are also unreasonable. So um, asking somebody to carry their animal down 30 flights of stairs, that's probably not going to cut it um, because you don't want them to take the lift, uh, for example. Um, don't take a lot of time to make the decision as a stalling tactic. That too is probably quite unreasonable. Um, I think you avoid, and I think you agree with this, Frank, avoid thinking about approvals as a precedent if you're on the committee. It's not a precedent. No, and that has been litigated ad nauseum in the Commissioner's Office. And the Commissioner's Office has always said, and higher courts do as well, just because it's been done incorrectly previously doesn't mean you need to continue that same incorrectness. If, if, if there's the right way to do things, regardless of what's happened previously, you must apply that. Absolutely. Um, step three, uh, committee be careful with your time frame. So from 1st of March, the laws changed in Queensland. 
Uh, and now there is a set time frame in which you must make a decision on a motion put forward for, by an owner. Uh, and that is six weeks, and then you have some options to extend. Um, but again, uh, you need to be very careful about that and that you're not simply taking time for the hell of it. Uh, that's not going to cut the mustard. Um, yes, we did a webinar on that, which we'll put up as well, where we speak about that sort of decision-making process for 30 minutes, mate. And I suppose from a committee perspective, previously there was no timeframes, there were no obligations, but now if you haven't said yes within the timeframes, it's a deemed refusal. So if yep. you don't say yes, it's no, which That's... then gives the applicant the right to make an application to the commissioner's office. I like that one, Frank. If you don't say yes, it's no. Yeah. Yeah. Be a good mantra for Strata, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, before we move on to the rest of the steps, I might just quickly leap in. Alana, thank you for your question. Would it be um, would it be reasonable for a committee to deny approval for a Wattweiler or German Shepherd? Alana, it depends on the situation. Um, and uh, that's not meant to be sounding deliberately vague, but it really does. Generally speaking, and see what you think here, Frank, but generally speaking, committees should not be denying approvals simply on the basis of breed. It does depend upon that specific animal there are some cases though there's one very uh recent and well-known case where uh, a committee's refusal based upon a particular breed was upheld wasn't it right mm, it was but the committee went and got the evidence that that particular breed wasn't suitable so yeah. you know and i suppose i'd start with german shepherd or rottweiler and start with their age mm. you know if it's six months old it's probably got a whole lot more energy than a 15 year old one who's probably going to sleep on the couch all day so you know it's that that blanket policy is what we're talking about. Rot wheelers, no. That that's not going to cut it. Yeah. So there would need to be something behind that specific animal, Alana. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we'll come back to those other questions shortly. Um, back to the committee. Step four, uh, committee. If something, if, if you're not sure about something, if a question arises, ask the question of the person applying. That's actually a form of being reasonable. And indeed, Frank not asking it is probably being unreasonable it is and i think it's sort of again it's a committee's not a court where you make an application the court's not obliged to go further a committee should be investigating um what is being asked of it and just recently it's been a couple of little sort of slaps for committees that don't quite do what the adjudicators think they should be doing, not the least of which was Artique recently, yeah. where a committee putting their hands in the air and saying, no, you go and figure it out, wasn't from an adjudicator's perspective appropriate behaviour. So if there is some doubt about it, ask. Absolutely. Um, step five, this relates to empathy. Put yourself in the applicant's shoes. If the pet approval is a condition of the sale going ahead, uh, do you really want to be the person who has the, who causes the contract to fall over? simply because you don't like animals. I, it's a difficult one, isn't it, Frank? But do you really want to be that person? Because that means the owner of the property is still going to be in the body corporate and they're going to be unhappy. Yeah. So that's not to say that's the reason to make it happen. Like you've still got to do your job and act reasonably, objectively and all those sort of things. But it's just, it is, it's very easy to lose sight of the overall picture when you nearly narrow down on legal principle. Do unto others, Frank. Uh, remember that if you make a refusal at this point on one set of grounds, those same set of grounds can be used against you at a later stage. Uh, we're not suggesting tit for tat ever happens, but it probably does. Um, step six, uh, committee, you can actually refuse animals uh, and you can do it quite legitimately. But I think it's fair to say, Frank, those circumstances are pretty limited, aren't they? Yeah, on balance, most animals have got to be approved, but there are grounds and adjudicators have held that to say no. But that's something to get legal advice on, really, rather than have a stab in the dark. Absolutely. Because each situation is specific to its circumstances. Very much so. Well said, Frank. And then for our final step, conditions are going to be your friend, committee, in all cases. Reasonable conditions are, will mean that the person applying for the animal is compelled to abide by them. And the instant that the animal breaches the conditions, that could potentially be grounds for removal. And yes. there are certainly orders where adjudicators have ordered the removal of an animal. And more than that, from a human behaviour perspective, Frank, if somebody is moving in, desperate to move in, desperate for their animal to come with them, if you put down a reasonable set of conditions, they'll happily tick that off, won't they? Yep, absolutely. And it's 
not unreasonable to do so. You know, all these magic reasonable words. You know, the animal won't um, defecate on common property. Completely reasonable. Should be doing that. No reason to have, there's no need to have that in the bylaw. In a sense, that's a reasonable condition that if breached can have the animal removed. And we've yep. certainly done that for bodies corporates. Absolutely. And so from the same perspective as we talked about the owner before, um, committees, what happens if you say no? What does happen, Frank? Well, that's um, BCCM applications. If I suppose the owner reacts in a, or sorry, the applicant reacts in a negative way, you might be off to the commissioner's office before you can blink. Um, and um, even though, you know, cost is one thing, time is another. Like commission's applications starting with conciliation, they're going to take sort of 10, 12, who knows, even 13, 14 months to get across the line. That is a long time to be dealing with something in the back of your mind. Yep. regardless and also it creates uncertainty for the building and everything so it's much better off trying to have and in back one step you never you never guaranteed of an outcome that's the unfortunate reality of it is that everyone goes into litigation thinking they're going to win and half the people lose so um, you're much better off trying to have a negotiated outcome with reasonable conditions that are capable of being enforced to allow everyone to move on particularly yep the subject to where the law might be in your particular position. Yep, agreed, Frank. Uh, a couple of other things. If you say no, then it's open to the applicant to seek a reconsideration and particularly, as we said before, with new information. And if they do provide new information, uh, you're obliged to look at that. Um, you can't just ignore the fact that somebody has asked for a reconsideration and addressing some of your initial comments too, for that matter. As we said before, I don't think you can discount empathy or, or the benefit of empathy. If you say no and it's a flat no or it's an unreasonable no, then you're putting that person offside. You're putting the current owner offside. You're putting the prospective owner or the prospective tenant offside. You're putting everybody associated with them offside as well. And you run the risk of that happening to you at a later stage. You've got to keep that in the back of your mind. I think there's also a role for compassion here, Frank. Um, so what if somebody comes along and says that the animal is an assistance animal and can back that up? Uh, do you want to be in the position where you're saying no to something which has got some documented benefits to someone's mental health? Not really. I wouldn't what? want to be. I wouldn't want to be. Uh, <laughs> some people are more bloody minded than you and I, though, mate. <laughs> That's, That's the true. problem. That's true. Uh, we're getting a stack of questions in, so we will get to those in a minute. Just we want to cover up a couple more. What happens if the committee says no? Um, if you are saying no, though, and you've got some strong grounds, for example, you sought advice from Frank, uh, who said you are quite entitled to say no under those circumstances, be prepared to stand behind it. So don't say no if you're not prepared to stand behind it, I guess is what we're saying, aren't we, Frank? Absolutely. Don't make a threat and not be willing to follow it through. Yeah. And of course, the big thing, say no, but with reasons. If you're going to say no, you we think you're obliged to say no with reasons. Yep. Um, try and get to some of these questions back up to Mandy. Thanks, Mandy. If the pet bylaws are unreasonable, how do you get approval if you know you can't walk up 30 flights of stairs? I think, Mandy, that's what we were talking about, that under those conditions, uh, that would probably be unreasonable. Uh, you would need to demonstrate that you had some difficulty walking 30 flights of stairs. I think it's pretty obvious. Most people would have that difficulty if it happened every day. Yeah. But say, for example, if you've got an arthritic knee, if you can produce some kind of doctor's report about that, that backs you up, doesn't it, Frank? What, what else would you it, it think? It does. And I think probably the other thing, and it wouldn't be the first uh, client to do it, is it's sometimes easier to seek forgiveness than ask permission. That happens a lot too. It does too. So, so the onus then goes back on to the people saying the bylaw has been breached to prove that it is lawful and enforceable. And that's yep. a battle doing that sort of thing. Absolutely. Uh, a couple of comments there from Wendy. Wendy, thank you. Just pointing out that uh, local council restrictions come into play here. So if there are local council restrictions, uh, that can be a consideration in the process. And there can um, be reasonable conditions if they're, yep. compli they're complying with whatever the local regulations are. Absolutely. Uh, from Gay, thank you, uh, Gay. If a committee approves four pets so the sale doesn't fall over with the proviso that when one of the pets dies, the approvals would go back to two per lot. Hmm. Interesting. Well, I think to me, that's a number thing. Where we've got two from the commissioner's office mm. is that numbers are definitely oppressive or unreasonable. So if four pets were okay, um, to me, it's coming back to the nuisance that those four pets might cause. Um, 
So if, if, if one dies and it was replaced with another one um, and it doesn't cause any more interference than the previous ones, then to me, the, it's going to be hard pressed for the body corporate to change that would be my but What the body corporate would could do and probably should have done in this case, if they're approving the four, um, they would name the four. And, and, and this is what happens if an adjudicator makes an order two. They make an order specific to the animal. Uh, they don't make it specific to the lot. Mm. It's specific to the animal. Mm. So if four are approved, it's Fido, Dido, Whiskers, and <laughs> whomever. Well and good. And then if Whiskers passes away, uh, there's no automatic right of replacement, if you want to put it in those terms. So each successive pet application should be considered afresh, if you like um and uh rose i guess thank you can it be reasonable to ask why a pet is visiting for example when indicated it will be there as often as desired i mean if, if, the, if there's an approval for the pet to be there my question is why you want to go and poke the bear that is arg arguing with people about how often it is there so to me the issue there is if it's causing a nuisance absolutely valid concern but if it's approved to be there how often it's there in that sense to me you know it's probably a little bit academic yeah and Dave, uh, you've just got a follow-up question there when the animal did die the new owner she was replacing one due to mental health needs well and good uh but it still needs to go through the approval process. process i suppose what we're saying is it's just not you don't automatically get to replace one animal with another necessarily it should should go through the process but the point that frank was making is that the actual number of pets of itself should be an issue hmm. that is it gosh that <laughs> um so just a reminder to everyone that the usual summing up that'll be available afterwards um and and we're doing this a little bit differently we're gonna have a link so if you're not watching well if you're watching this live it'll be there and if you're watching this at some later stage there's going to be a link in whatever you're watching this on now that has uh what do we call them chris show notes yeah Sum summary the links to the webinars we've been talking about and all that sort of stuff so a tiny little bit more structure from our end which isn't a bad thing yeah um a, a lot there to go through uh we'll be doing a few more of the how-to series into the future but i think that's it for today frank thank you thank you chris thank you everyone always a hot topic bets yeah thanks everyone for making the effort to tune in today much appreciated agree